Thank you for joining us. We welcome you to the AIM North America Smart Packaging Webinar. My name is Mary Lou Bosco, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here with AIM North America. Today's panelists are leading experts in the packaging industry. We have Clemson University's Andrew Hurley, who is the Associate Professor in the Food, Nutrition, and Packaging Sciences Department. We also have Bill Stafford, who works as a Senior Global Alliance Manager for Digimark Corporation. And last but not least, we have Jeannie Duckett with Avery Jet Dennison. Jeannie is the Manager of Technology Development for their printer systems. Welcome, everyone, and let's get started. Phil, how do you see smart packaging evolving? Thank you, Mary Lou. I think it will become a way for retailers and brands to drive trust and efficiencies across the supply chain. The reality is that consumer brand manufacturers today must contend with product recalls, data breaches, and new legislation, basically forcing them to rethink their efforts surrounding quality, transparency, and traceability. They also have to rely um, timely and accurate data from across their supply chain to engender trust and loyalty from their customers, suppliers, and retail partners, while at the same time uh, drive greater efficiencies and reduce operational costs. And so what is driving some of these factors for change? Well, research has proven that today's consumers want more from their packaging with 78% declaring that store packaging is not delivering the information they desire. In addition, 87% of millennials say that they will produce or purchase online if they can't get that information during their shopping trip. This will result in lost sales to brick and mortar stores or the risk that it, to the brand that a competing product will be chosen. Consumers today want to know more about than ever before about the products they buy and use. There's a greater sense of responsibility tied to the choices they make in terms of sustainability, cruelty-free, non-GMO, and other product attributes that support consumers' evolving personal preferences. I've also been working with customers who are gravely concerned about addressing and improving their supply chain through track and trace solutions, where serializing their consumer-facing packaging is not just a nice to have, but is or will be mandated. Thank you, Phil. And Andrew, how can a brand understand ROI of smart packaging prior to market launch? Um, what this is showing is, is the importance of primary research. It doesn't matter you know, what you're working on, what product you're in, what category you compete in. Understanding primary research to me is, is of utmost importance. And um, the features of any, any packaging systems needs to be empirically understood. And the comparison here is distribution testing. I don't think anyone would argue that distribution testing is not important. It allows us to understand, you know, the, the, the real ROI of protective packaging with data. So that's, with that same logic, um, just as package distribution testing, um, it, it applies to also human-centric features like sensors, smart labels, and digital connectivity elements. So I, I think that Shopper and user testing is essential, you know, for, for any increase at, or investment in your packaging. Collecting that primary data on your products and your competition is important, along with your packaging without that technology. So you really can't understand the ROI. If, if there isn't an increase in attention, if you're not commanding attention faster, if it's not longer, or if you haven't really changed the, the overall, um, you, know, uh, you know, negativity stance uh, with your with your packaging, I, I think it, it, that empirical data helps you really understand the value of what you're about to invest in. So my, my three takeaways here would be, you know, understand how quickly your packaging commands attention compared to your competition. Uh, also, uh, how does your package retain attention at the point of sale compared to your competition? And from a third, the, the last thing is what, where, and when do negative experiences happen when interacting with your packaging compared to your competition and compared to your existing packaging without the, um, the investment that you're considering, uh, whether it be a smart label or, or some digital connectivity point with, with, um, on your design, that primary research really helps you understand uh, the impact on human behavior that you're having. 
That's really interesting, Andrew. Is there a particular case that you can share with us that you learned something interesting through this primary research technique? Um, it, we, we did a study uh, this December on the seasonal eggnog category. And um, My favorite. We, we just, it's, it's, it is a, a holiday staple, right? And uh, we went around and we collected all the different SKUs from, our, from about five different retailers. We put them together, had people go and shop for them, and, and we tracked all this data. But then we took, we took another step and we asked them to actually taste test the eggnog. And uh, we gave them a lineup of six different SKUs to taste. Three of those, we, we put the packaging right there in front of the little cups that you could taste the eggnog. And then there were three other little cups with no packaging. Uh, what the participants didn't know in the study was that the other three were the exact same as the ones um, in front of the packaging. We had a like super premium organic, you know, high-end eggnog, and then we had a mass, uh, you know, a, a, a fairly large brand that was in their mid-tier and then we had a store brand uh, low tier. What we found out was that overwhelmingly, the premium organic um, uh, packaging was absolutely the best tasting of them all, you know, with the packaging included. Uh, and the, on the hedonic scale rating and self reports, it was number one. But the worst tasting eggnog by far by everybody was the exact same eggnog, but that super premium organic eggnog, it just wasn't with the packaging. And to me, that was extremely illuminating experience, being that your packaging it has a huge impact on the experience of the product and how you feel about it. So every little tiny aspect of your packaging communicates brand equity and sets expectations around the whole product experience. And uh, it's just a recent case study uh, for me, but um, uh, you know, towards the end here, I'll give you uh, another one that, that is more towards, you know, making those tweaks and the impact that it had on sales. Um, Jeannie, what are the benefits to the brand owner and its consumers of a package that connects consumers to digital information? Well, uh, thank you, Mary Lou. I would be happy to speak on that. Over the last few years, there's been a lot of development within what's being called smart, intelligent, or connected packaging. Digitally connected packaging can be enabled with a variety of sensor technologies as shown on the screen, 2D barcodes, and other smart codes such as the Digimark. We live in a world that we've been discussing today where technology can now be integrated into everything. Digitally connected packaging is creating lots of opportunities for companies. They can use connected packaging to improve their brand image and recognition and to ensure a better supply chain quality and control. In essence, this is the way for companies to transform physical packs into interactive brand tools. Connected packaging and on-pack digital communication is helping producers get into the minds of today's consumer. This means driving digital engagement and transparency within every pack while improving brand recognition and providing quality assurance. It means that brands can add real value with new functionality and enhanced user experiences. And as Phil pointed out, this is important in today's world where people have multiple opportunities and multiple challenges, channels in which to purchase through. One of the enhanced experiences include, where did this product come from? It's a simple question that is really fueling the new era of transparent and traceable products. Consumers want to buy healthy and quality food that they can trust. Consumers want to know where it comes from, who it produced it, where it's been, and how did it get to their table. They want to understand the food supply chain from farm to fork, and for this added peace of mind this last Thanksgiving, millennials were willing to pay a premium price for this information. Many businesses are already using traceability systems to automatically collect data at every stage of the product's journey to improve their internal business processes. But this information is now being made available to consumers to meet their growing demand for product transparency. 
With advanced traceability and systems, producers can not only optimize their business process, but also strengthen consumer confidence in the quality and safety of their products. According to a recent report by Allied Marketing Research, the global food traceability market is expected to be worth more than $19 billion by 2023. Thank you, Jeannie. Andrew, how can shopper and user engagement to smart packaging be understood and re refined? Uh, to answer that question, thinking about what you may have heard prior with the, the importance of collecting primary research within your, your target category, um, analyzing that data uh, to me helps us really understand engagement and how to refine uh, whatever element on your packaging that you're considering investing in. So all design elements, including interactive and smart components, can be built around consumer and user data. And once you have that primary research, we can iterate on the design, making really small changes to understand the impact on human behavior. The, the goal is really to, to ask data questions in order to provide design feedback and optimize um, you know, whatever feature of the packaging you're considering. You know, over, over the past 10 years, we've, we've built a database of over 1.2 billion user data points that we leverage as a baseline to compare the impact of a proposed modification um, uh, to a package compared to how people generally interact with packaging in that category. I'm also a believer in emotion coding. It allows us to understand the experience in real time uh, without the need for people to self-report about the, the experience itself. Um, with emotion coding, we can understand how a consumer or a shopper feels without them telling us, and we can dive into that experience and exactly what part of that experience needs to be improved based on negativity that, that is the outcome of interacting with the component you're considering investing in. So Andrew, you're telling me that if you were conducting a study on new packaging and I was a subject in your study, that if I came in, picked up the, uh, the packaging, the bottle or the can, and put it right back down, you would, would be able to summarize some results for my actions? From a primary data point, we would be able to understand perceptually how you engaged with the packaging, what you looked at first, what you looked at last, what you didn't look at at all, um, and then as well as emotionally understanding how you felt about the experience. And, and this information is coded up to 50 times per second. We're able to capture data points across uh, perception and emotion uh, with, with a shopper or a user doing just about any task uh, we ask them to do. Well, that's fascinating. So when you do this, um, this uh, tracking and these studies, do you conduct these in like stores of the future or would I be able to find uh, this type of uh, study in, just in my local retailer? Studies in, in context. So it depends on your marketplace. Uh, for, you know, a lot of us uh, you know, compete within retail grocery. So uh, we could take these devices into any store uh, on the planet or we, we use a, a couple of our own retail labs. And so we'll build the category out. It looks just like a grocery store. You can enter into it. Uh, we also test in the digital space, so if you have an e-commerce uh, venue or something like Amazon, um, this can be understood as well, as well as other alternative marketplaces like social media as well and the interactions and understanding the impact of photography and, and video that includes your packaging. Uh, all of that can be, uh, you know, all that data can still be collected within that, the, the context of that um, uh, marketplace. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And Jeannie, can you discuss what is functional packaging? This new emerging term called functional packaging is packaging that is designed to provide value-added consumer benefits. These benefits can include greater convenience, ease of use, or a built-in reuse recycling strategy. It may incorporate flexible packaging and pressure-sensitive films, recoser solutions, intelligent labels, and other sensor technologies such as temperature or CO2 in new and creative ways. Flexible packaging uses combinations of materials, primarily paper, film, and foil, to form pouches with the properties needed to protect the contents. 
Reclosures incorporate pressure-sensitive films and a resealable adhesive and flexible packages. These adhesives are used in an ever-expanding number of applications to promote the reuse, including those requiring FDA approval. Intelligent labels can also be integrated into these packagings, for example, through RAIN RFID, NFC, or QR codes to enhance the consumer experiencing, including item-level customization, delivering product reviews and product authentication while enabling the brands and retailers to track their inventory more accurately and thereby meet the growing consumer demand for transparency and authentication. Um, what drives consumer action with smart packaging? You know, when, when, when we're shopping or doing anything, it doesn't matter if you're in your computer in front of your favorite e-commerce store or you're, you're in a grocery store or you're, you're just walking around in, in an open market, we use our senses um, when we engage with just about anything. And this includes the packaging. In, in a Walmart, there's over 140,000 SKUs, and we don't see most of what is available to consume. So in my opinion, unseen is unconsumed, it's unsold, and it's unused. So to me, commanding attention is first priority. And there's a lot of tactics and design theory that we can deploy. But bottom line, that primary research helps you understand who commands the most attention within the category. Um, next, uh, we need to uh, ensure that we retain that attention, not just you know, we look at it first and then move on. We need to absolutely retain that attention. Our communication hierarchy needs to be optimized, and we need to ensure that we have engaging content. And by analyzing our primary data, we can understand what is engaging and what is not, and eliminate or optimize from there. Lastly, we need to ensure a positive and engaging experience and reduce negativity. Uh, there's a lot of data that, that's you know, output from a lot of these biometric sensors that you can use to analyze anything, like packaging. And for me with emotion, it's a negativity. If, if there's a negative experience, it's lasting. And understanding why there's a negative experience and what moment within the process that happens, that can include pulling out your smartphone and engaging with the packaging. If there's an issue and it has a negative experience, that can be very well identified and, and defined. So uh, the packaging that you see on the screen here represents, a, this is real, it's a company that I worked with. And it shows the before and after shots. The ones on the top are where we started, and the ones on the bottom are where we ended. There was no substrate change. There was no print method change. It was just simple tweaks to the graphics and information hierarchy. Um, in our lab, we estimated a 30% increase in sales just from going through seven different um, small study iterations. And we looked at different photography. We looked at different fonts and co color contrast. Um, everything about this was completely data-driven. Uh, we worked with good designers, and we fed them the data and, and let them go with it. And we tested and tested seven different times. And when we launched, we saw a 40% increase in sales from a category that was looking at, you know, plus or minus negative 3% for the decade prior. So um, to me, um, you know, going through a data-driven process to look at the investments you're considering making on your packaging and, and getting empirical data on that, you know, helps you, you know, uh, uh, put together and, under, and, and bring to a level of certainty um, with your design and communicating what you're building for, the, for your customer's customer, ultimately that consumer who sh who's at the retailer. And, um, you know, if, if you're a packaging provider or a brand themselves, this, this is the type of data that, that those in marketplaces are looking for to have confidence and, and your new launch or, you know, also being an, a co-investor with you as you deploy new technology on your packaging. Hey, Andrew, has there been any studies or what does your data show for other types of um, symbols on a packaging, such as all the claims that people like to make, like GMO, um, you know, dairy-free, not so much dairy-free, but peanut-free. Do those types of symbols and logos attract people's attentions? Do people actually re react to the certification claims? It is completely different. And symbols and certifications um, operate very differently. I mean, there's in certain aspects, the USDA organic symbol is very important, and the OTC healthcare 
Um, there, there are other symbols that are re related to whatever you know condition you may have that you're trying to remedy are important. But, but to me, when when you're making a decision, you have very few precious seconds, and, and in many cases, just fractions of a second to communicate. And understanding that it goes back to primary data, how people observe. Um, recently, we did a study for more of the premium on-the-go snacking of, uh, of, you know, it was premium type of products and single serving packaging. And we noticed that brand, the brand of these products consistently was looked at number third in the list. People were searching for benefits and brands that had designs where the benefits were at the very bottom of the pack, people lost interest and moved on to the next thing. So I guess to answer that question, we need the primary data to understand how people shop in that category, which can be easily understood and documented and then experiment with if you've made an investment in a symbol or a certification there is the proper place for it and that can be tested understood so you can achieve the greatest amount of roi for the investment in whatever that symbol or certification is that you've um, that you're considering thank you andrew um, i'm curious you just mentioned roi and I'm, I'm curious how you would respond to um um, a brand um, who would come to you and, and ask you that question about ROI. Um, I would assume that you have some sort of um, basis and back, um, background around ROI um, on some of this work that you do. Oh, I, is, is a vague term. I mean, it, there could be a lot of different things and it depends on where you are in your, in your brand cycle. Um, for a startup company, it's about awareness. So, you know, attention, you know, on, on the value and the, and the value proposition is important uh, for other brands that are in different in their in the, in the sales cycle. Um, you know, they, they're very interested in converting that attention, right, in, into a sale. So, um, you know, in, in many cases, packaging is about driving attention. Um, there's an element that is appealing and we focus on it. There's an embellishment and embossing a foil stamp or even, uh, you know, a QR code, for instance, that we're asking someone to either look at it or, or create human action to, to utilize it. And so to me, the ROI would be what, you know, if I'm going to trade, you know, my primary display panels real estate for uh, an indicator or a symbol or whatever it may be, I want to know that, you know, that, that the usage of that space is being used appropriately and it's, and it's attracting people and um, it's actually converting our, the intended um, behavior uh, for people that engage with it. So defining ROI is, is, um, is different for everybody and it's establishing those goals are, are first step. Um, you can't really do a research experiment unless you have, uh, you know, a, a goal that you're trying to achieve and some, you know, a, a test process in order to hopefully that this investment will get us further along, you know, down that road to achieving this, this intended, re, um, you know, behavioral um, action from our target audience. Great, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Phil, we're going to move over to you. If we look beyond packaging, what are the other opportunities for brands? Sure. For, well, from my point of view, I see a few opportunities for both brands and retailers. Um, most brands will invest in in-store point-of-purchase displays and, and do not leverage the opportunity to link the connected packaging and the POP together. Most of these displays are static by nature, but could easily become interactive through smartphone connectivity and expand the brand promise they were designed to support. And all it really takes is a well thought out call to action strategy and a digital trigger to open up a direct connection to the consumer. And here's another opportunity that I see. Um, the, the majority of brands will spend a tremendous amount of money and time to create their digital brand assets, such as product imagery, while having no idea if they're being used inappropriately. And at Digimark, our experience is that we, we offer a, a solution that enables brands and rights holders and digital asset managers to better manage the, the use of these images and other assets throughout the supply chain and across the public internet. Combining the imperceptible identifiers with the complementary web crawling services, the customers will benefit from greater insight into where brand assets are being used, providing unprecedented intelligence for better brand management. And this would include um, any sort of gray market activity where you're um, 
maybe illegitimate, illegitimate website might be promoting your product um, improperly and, and really have no control over that um, at all or even not even realizing it, it's, it's happening. Thank you, Phil. Um, Jeannie, how can interactive packages also be environmentally friendly? Well, thank you, Mary Lou. Um, first off, in this environmental friendly, I want to talk a little bit about Amazon frustration-free packaging. Um, last September, Amazon sent letters to thousands of their brand owners impacted by the certification requirements for their frustration-free packaging or functional packaging that all brand owners need to be certified that they're going to sell in the Amazon marketplace by August 1st. 2019. Frustration-free packaging is packaging that's made of 100% recyclable materials, easy to open, and designed to ship in the original packaging, which eliminates the need for the additional shipping boxes. This frustration-free packaging was designed with the consumer in mind, making it very easy to remove the product from their package while also reducing the waste required from the packaging. Since 2008, when Amazon started down this path, this frustration-free packaging or functional packaging has grown to include more than 750,000 products. And in, as of December 2017, the sustainable packaging innovations has eliminated 215,000 tons of packing material and avoided shipping 360 million shipping boxes. So, uh, this program that started very small uh, back in 2008 started with uh, products enclosed in hard plastic cases known as clamshell cells and secured with plastic coated wirings, which are commonly used in the toy packaging, such as that packaging to put a dowel or a Barbie dowel in, where you had to remove all the wirings before you could get the uh, item out. In functional packaging or sustainable packaging, these types of enclosures have been modified to be a, a packaging type that is very easy to remove the product from the package and also reduce the amount of waste. Also inc included in these are smart labels. And these smart labels, as we've been discussing today, shown in the lower uh, corner of your screen, enable retailers and brands to engage directly with the consumers, as Phil was mentioning. Um, this, in turn, provides the consumers with transparency and convenience that they want in this packaging and the consumers can now use their smartphone to read the smart label for product information, promotional offers, and more before, during, and after purchase, including recycling and reuse instructions. So these uh, smart labels and the functional packaging are enabling consumers to engage to, uh, through e-commerce with the information on the screen or through the physical packaging with a smart and intelligent package to get the information they need to properly use the product. These intelligent labels themselves are made out of a, a technology called smart face technology, and it's one of Avery's sustainable solutions on the market. The PET carrier in the RAIN RFID label has been replaced with paper, which reduces the amount of plastic in these intelligent labels. This creates an RFID inlay that uses just a paper, aluminum, and a small amount of silicon and these packages can process into the recycling chain. In addition to these uh, uh, packaging like this, there's also new uses for intelligent packaging in the sorting of funct a sorting function required for uh, plastic and other recyclables. There are innovative uses of smart labels that have invisible markers, such as those from Digimark, that enable uh, these items to be detected and sorted using Octobill sorting systems. The labels and the markers are removed completely by the recycling process. This new technology is seen as a very efficient way of sorting materials such as the PP food packaging, the HDPE milk bottles, and other sleeve PET. So these are some of the ways that uh, functional intelligent packaging are also can be environmentally friendly. Thank you, Jeannie. And I also would like to thank all of our panelists um, today. Um, I do have a list of questions that have been sent via the chat. If you have any questions and have not um, submitted them yet, um, this is a good time. Um, right now I have about four or five to review. 
I also understand that some folks were having some trouble um, sending a chat. So if you are one of those people, please send your questions to me via email at Mary Lou, M-A-R-Y-L-O-U, at aimglobal, A-I-M-G-L-O-B-A-L dot org. And we'll be sure to get to them. So um, panelists, uh, these questions are not directed to any one person. Um, so you all are free to respond to them and multiple um, comments from the panelists are always welcome as well. Um, the first question is what categories should be interested in smart packaging in terms of ROI? I thought is every single one of them. I think that <laughs> Thank you. We're, we're just, <laughs> we're just starting uh, uh, in this. I think that there's more and more tools. Um, I think whoever develops a blockchain recycling app that gets your points and rewards from your brand will be a millionaire. And um, uh, every, every single category can benefit from interactivity and, and more smart components and features. It's, it's truly trying to understand, going back to that primary data, what are the, the needs of the consumer? What are causing pain uh, during that decision-making process? And how can we leverage a brand new medium in order to bring new solutions to the table? I, that, that's a very good uh, answer. The other thing, um, I've been recently following the proceedings of the Global Seafood Traceability Dialogue. And the thing that we didn't hit too much on today, but is, is also very true, a lot of this functional packaging and these sensors being used in the supply chain are aimed at waste, uh, reducing food waste. So currently today's food supply chain, we waste about one third of all the food that is produced. In the fishing industry, it's at, that's actually between 40 and 50% of all the fish that is caught is wasted. So the opportunities to reduce waste with improved uh, supply chain efficiencies and intelligent sensors on these packagings, I think we're just, just now just starting to see the benefits that are going to be reaped from that. The next question is, can smaller brands afford smart packaging? Um, I, I would think, yeah, <laughs> the, back to Andrew, the answer is absolutely. Yes. Um, there, there are several ways for uh, small brands to engage with smart packaging. There are, are companies that are in the business of providing sm uh, functional packaging that um, have smart marks already on them for small artesian brands. There are, for medium-sized companies, there's a variety of platforms out there that are providing a lot of this consumer engagement uh, tied to uh, a QR code or an NFC chi um, RFID chip. So yes, I would think all players from the artesian all the way to your uh, consumer brands can participate in the benefits from smart packaging. I, I want to very entry. Um, it, uh, low barrier to entry is a QR code, and that can completely uh, connect a brand with their end, uh, the end consumer, um, you know, and, and that has traditionally been siloed out by the marketplace. So just something as simple as that um, has a lot of problems, as well as this year, um, augmented reality um, should be a device inherent across Android and, and iOS for experiences. Yeah, I would like to add that um, from my point of view, I actually see the smaller brands are the ones that are disrupting this, this side of the business where um, some of these larger brands um, are a little slower to move just because of how their infrastructure is set up. So I would actually encourage any small brand to uh, um, look at the connected packaging as a way to set themselves apart. Thank you, panelists. Um, next question is, which smart packaging technologies are readily available now, and what do you project for the future of smart packaging? Well, um, as we've been discussing today, in 2019, there is a wide variety of 2D symbols and other optical marks available now. 
there are very low cost temperature sensors or gas sensors that are available. There's augmented reality solutions, as Andrew is mentioning, that are going to be available in 2019. And your RAIN RFID and NFC applications are pretty, uh, pretty well established in the market at this point in time, at least as accepted uh, technologies that are connected and available. So pretty much everything that we've been talking about today is available today. Um, I'll defer to Andrew on what's coming in the future. I think the future is a pretty exciting place. I mean, I, I, we were uh, not too long ago talking about uh, marketplaces that are drones and cars, and they just kind of come up to your home if you want an apple. And uh, this is what excites me about packaging because at the end of the day, packaging is the constant. And at the end of the day, brands cannot change their products. If they change the product, it's no longer the product, it's something else. And the packaging is what they can use to differentiate themselves. The future is absolutely pointed towards taking that medium, that substrate that, that we all work with and connecting it as far reaching as possible. Every brand is interested in understanding their consumer better and smart packaging allows them to directly communicate with, with the buyer, with the user, with the consumer, which will ultimately rise the tides for packaging effectiveness and you know, really getting good data on what's effective and, and, and what's not. So I, I'm excited about more and more brands pushing all different types of new tech into the marketplace. Thank you. Um, can someone explain the difference between active packaging and smart packaging? Active packaging is packaging that has um, technology built into it to monitor the contents of the product, uh, such as temperature sensors, CLT sensors, and functions to extend the life of the product that is packaged. They're primarily in food and pharmaceutical uh, market segments. Um, intelligent packaging is Basically, as we've been talking about, any type of sensor that you want to use to connect um, and engage throughout the supply chain and with the consumer. Thank you. The, the next round of um, questions talks about mandates and privacy issues. Um, can someone elaborate on um, track and trace becoming a mandate? Um, would this only be applied to serialized track and trace? Um, I believe this is more for Phil. Um, but when you made that statement, were you referring to the drug manufacturing packaging industry? Um, yes, there, there are several mandates um, that are already happening globally. So in Europe, there's some um, mandates already um, in motion with, uh, around the pharmaceutical side um, of, of categories. Um, here in the U.S., um, I think we're, we're a little slower, I guess, to adopt some of these, um, but they are coming, um, whether they're uh, track and trace for pharmaceutical or agricultural, like fresh pr produce, where we've all experienced uh, recalls that take a significant amount of time to uh, uncover and where source of product is coming from that might be tainted. Um, so there's, uh, the I think, a lot of regulatory um, uh, processes are going to be put into place um, that will have to be followed, and this is uh, this is where serialization will come into play, where they'll have to be individually uh, tracked IDs to be able to uh, pinpoint uh, the source of where that product came from. Um, and I, I think there's emerging, as, as Phil mentioned, there's emerging standards in the food that will be coming into play. Um, Currently in tests in Belgium and in Luxembourg, across point of sale, they are scanning what's known as the GS1 digital link. The GS1 digital link contains enhanced product content containing product lot number, serial number, and expiration date. And in retail uh, grocery in those countries now, they're stopping products from being sold that are recalled or expired, and that, that is in place today.
regarding privacy issues that may come from um, smart packaging, is there a way um, to turn the collection of data on and off? And is this, a for, is this being regulated? Well, certainly you're, good question. you're good question. It, yeah, good question. Go ahead, Andrew. I, I this is that's not my subject matter expertise by by any means, but um, you know my my thought is uh, in the the cannabis sector is very interesting. Um, you know the the idea of collecting data from seed all the way to that final end good is 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 really revolutionary. What's going on in the states that have um, have legalization and retail centers. And um, my thought is e the retail establishments themselves collect a level of data that, that it, it's mind boggling from your full identification. And um, I think that um, as regulations and um, things get into place and, and more states um, open up these new marketplaces, I, I think that all of us should be following that industry carefully because how they are tracking and tracing and collecting data is very different than we've ever I've ever seen in any form of retail, and um, if it is successful and implemented, I absolutely think that that the the learnings from that particular marketplace might might find its way into retail. So um, I guess taking that question to the next level, that there's uh, could be even more data co captured and collected across um, as interactions with packaging and the marketplace itself. So that, that question really refers to two places, and the primary question was directed at the consumer. A lot of the smart packaging today or intelligent packaging today in store with the consumer is enabled by the QR code. The QR code, which is recognized by uh, without apps on people's cell phones, actually doesn't collect any data at all from the consumer because it's just a cell phone app. So those are pretty benign for the consumers. However, if you're tying your recognition of these QR codes to a store's uh, app or a store loyalty program, such as some of the ones out by Retail Grocery, I would assume that that uh, app is collecting more data. But inherently, smart packaging can be used without um, impacting collecting of data from the consumer. In the supply chain, as we become more, reduce the friction in the supply chain and make event uh, passing more and more from, cons uh, from the producer to the consumer, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of permissions being talked about what information actually is going to be ch uh, shared between the suppliers of a brand and that they can see to try to protect the uh, brand integrity and uh, trade secrets of the different suppliers. So there's also a lot of discussions in the supply chain on this topic. Okay, this next question has to deal with um, invisible barcodes. So, Phil, I think this is your area of expertise. Um, it's a follow-up to the track and trace question. Um, the GS1 digital link that is in place today, um, driven by visible barcodes or invisible DW codes? Yeah, so both symbologies um, are, are capable of a GS1 digital leak standard, um, whether it's a, a QR code or a, a DW code, um, otherwise known as Digimark barcode. So either, um, either platform, either symbology um, can be used the same way, if that's, if that's the point of the question. Yeah, correct. And can someone please elaborate on watermarking and how that can help? Um, I'm sorry, can you elaborate on how watermarking can help with recycling? I can, I can chime in here, and I'm sure Jeannie can, can um, supplement this. But um, I know from our point of view as a company, we're, we're being asked um, um, from all kinds of different um, parties and, and um, uh, retailers and um, suppliers um, about digital watermarking product to the point where it can make the when the packaging is ending up at the end of the um, the use cycle that can be identified as Jeannie mentioned earlier um, watermarking is just one of the different technologies that is being looked at um, 
and any sort of identifier that does not contaminate the package itself into the recycling supply chain. Correct, and, and I believe uh, the, the usage would be similar to the supply chain usage, whereas that, uh, you know, an optical reader or another type of uh, data collection device can be used to recognize the mark and automatically sort the item, whether it's plastic or metal, and automatically sort the item to reduce the cost involved in recycling. Thank you. And the next question um, has to do with new packaging. I'm sorry, can the new packaging improve tamper visibility? Can it help increase a product's shelf life? That almost sounded like two uh, questions to me. Um, so uh, functional packaging can, uh, and correctly divine packaging can definitely enhance a, a product's ability to be tampered with, or at least uh, to make it obvious if a product's tampered with that it has been tampered with, and there's a number of different strategies in that. Uh, extending product life has to do with um, correct point of use, temperature monitoring, uh, monitoring of other gases, and uh, sealing to prevent uh, contamination of the product. Yeah, I should add to some of these technologies, these active packaging technologies, um, as well as identifying um, product um, um, expiration dates. Um, when, when it's used properly in the retail environment, it can um, um, be used to identify products that might be reaching, a, uh, reaching expiration and thus maybe uh, uh, lowering the price, if you will, to be able to help right. push that product out the door rather than having it just sit there and expire and then be tossed. Don't wait. Right. Yeah, intelligent price, price markdown. We have a question about RFID labels. Um, are RFID-based labels available that self-destruct when open? Um, so I'm going to read a little bit into that question. I'm going to assume that there's an RFID inlay over the surface where a product is going to be opened. And yes, if you're using a smart base smart face technology which is based upon a paper substrate versus a PET substrate, that substrate is easy to damage and render ineffective by just uh, tearing through it. And Phil, please forgive me, you may have already covered this, um, but there's a question about the invisible labels, um, the Digimark labels, how are they read? Um, all, all of the Digimark technology is read through um, uh, our SDK, so any app base, it's an app based uh, solution where it needs to be read and um, our software development kit can be incorporated in any consumer facing app and that's, that's the primary uh, way to uh, read our barcode. In that consumer facing app then, uh, Phil, would that be used, what, what uh, data capture device would that use? The the phone's camera or another one? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's using the phone camera to uh, see um, and read the barcode and identify that via the app. All right, um, that concludes our webinar. Um, I do want to thank our panelists, um, Jeannie, Andrew, and Phil, um, for your time. Um, we appreciate the expertise that you have shared with the audience today. Um, from the audience, we have been recording um, this presentation, so the slide deck and the audio recording um, will be available within the next week. We'll also be sending out a survey um, for you to evaluate the content um, of this presentation and would appreciate your feedback, especially with other topics that you would like to hear discussed on future um, webinar discussions. Thank you, Mary Lou. I thank everyone, and you have a wonderful day. Thank you.